Hello, everyone. We've, uh, we're nearly there. You've, you've almost made it. Thank you all so much uh, for joining us. I know we're going to be a little bit short on time, and so we're just going to go ahead and, and move right into it. Uh, my name is Kip Wainscott. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Kip Wainscott. I'm a senior advisor at the National Democratic Institute. We are a global democracy NGO. Uh, we work around the world on issues like strengthening and supporting democratic institutions, mechanisms for electoral integrity, responsive governance, uh, all of these fun democracy issues. And sort of within that context, uh, civic tech has certainly emerged um, and it become an increasingly elevated focus area across our programs. And we appreciate that a uh, strong and sustainable civic tech movement uh, would be a very positive and powerful force multiplier for the democracy community. And so um, to that end, we've been formally partnering with the Code for All Network uh, on a number of issues since, since 2016. But in, more recently in thinking about uh, how we might broaden support for civic tech, We've partnered with a number of organizations, uh, including the Omidyar Network, uh, My Society, who are both represented uh, in this conversation, to organize and convene a donors forum for civic tech that we are planning um, to, to convene in July at, at the margins of the OGP Summit in Tbilisi. And so we're hopeful that this conversation today, this discussion can help to inform uh, the, uh, and, and help us sort of optimize the value of, of that convening in July as, as we prepare for it. Um, we have, uh, we're very fortunate to have a collection of uh, very bright voices to contribute to this conversation. I think maybe in the interest of time, if we could maybe weave introductions into a, sort of a, a kickoff question that um, I think is, sort of a big state of the movement question. Uh, I'd love to hear from each of you, from your respective vantages, in, in thinking about funding and sustainability, uh, how would you assess the overall health of civic tech? Uh, what's working? What needs to change? Uh, Stacy, maybe we could start with you and just work our way down. Hi, I'm Stacy Donahue. I'm an investment partner and managing director at Omidyar Network's Governance and Citizen Engagement Initiative. Uh, and I lead civic tech investing globally across the firm. Uh, so one of the things um, that is a bit unique about um, our civic tech investing is that we do both for-profit investing and non-profit grant making in this space. And I'm curious to know by a show of hands, is anyone in the room um, working for a for-profit company in the civic tech space? <laughs> Yeah, so, um, so I, I think that's an interesting observation here as we think about the overall landscape for civic tech to answer your question, Kit, um, that it is a broad landscape that includes um, both nonprofit civil society players and for-profit companies. Um, with respect to what that outlook looks like right now for us, I, I would say there are reasons for optimism and, and some reasons um, to pause. On the optimistic side, um, engagement is at you know, all new levels um, for reasons that um, are probably obvious to most of us um, uh, because of the state of democracy around the world. So uh, if user apathy was the problem a few years ago with civic tech, that's no longer the issue. Uh, and we see in, um, in the U.S. environment that funding for engagement-related civic tech um, is definitely taking off, uh, and the number of organizations that are starting new projects or companies uh, around uh, civic tech for engagement is also booming. An example would be New Media Ventures, uh, which is a, a very early stage funder in this space and a funder that we have contributed to. Um, did a rebuild and resist um, open call for projects, and um, in this last round got 500 applications, which was double uh, the applications they'd ever gotten before. <coughs> They've since done yet another call around storytelling for engagement and gotten over 700 applications. So, um, so that is you know, one data point around optimism, that there is more usage of civic tech happening. Uh, on the for-profit side, there's definitely more investment 
happening in this space. Um, venture capitalists, you know, however you feel about them, are um, are definitely getting more involved in investing in for-profit companies. Um, and acquisitions of for-profit civic tech companies are um, on the rise. Just yesterday, Socrata announced that it's being acquired um, by a U.S. company called Tyler Technologies. So, so those are some of the data points that are you know, optimistic in terms of availability of funding and also user engagement. Uh, on the flip side, um, you know, it is still, as I think we all know, a really fragmented space in terms of funding. Um, and one of the things that, that Kip and, and we are working together on is um, to try to get new funders in the space um, who <coughs> haven't traditionally funded civic tech for its own sake, but tend to be very issue-oriented in their funding. And so it's trying to bring those issue-oriented funders um, uh, into the space to get more familiar with how tech could be an element of the types of things that they fund. So all in all, talking fast here because we don't have much time, um, I'd say it's a mixed picture with some reasons um, for hope, um, but things that we still need to work on. Um, so with my society, I'm Mark from my society, I think you know that by now. Um, my society is something of a hybrid and as much as we are a not-for-profit organization, we're a charity, but we have a wholly owned commercial subsidiary as well. And one of the... Um, I guess the reason I was hired, uh, or one of the reasons I was hired to go over from Tom was because of my previous commercial experience and having grown a startup organization. And when, when I joined, I just naively assumed, because we had this wonderful funder, Amidiar, who was, was, was really paying quite a large uh, proportion of, um, uh, of their grant covered a large proportion of our costs. I just assumed, well, I'll just go out and find some more Amidiars and they will fund everything else. And then I think it took me a, a, just a few weeks to realize that there are quite so many Amidias as, as there could be. Uh, and actually funding needed to come from a, from a, uh, a different set of sources. And so obviously the, 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 from a charitable perspective here, the, the funding we always want to find, the holy grail is those large unrestricted grants which just let you, especially as a relatively large organization in the field, we are about 30 people, which historically for me is not a large organization, but within the, the civic tech field is, is, is fairly substantial. And what comes with that is overheads and salaries and you know, careers and your know, long-term ambitions of individual staff. So you need to have the ongoing funding to be able to support that. But you know, that's not always straightforward. Um, and you know, the project-based funding, and in, 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 uh, uh, Stacey talked about the, um, the issue-based funding, that obviously often comes with, it's relatively smaller in, in amount. It often comes with a set of constraints or uh, outcomes or outputs rather that, that need to be delivered against. And if those outputs don't align with your day-to-day -day work, actually those 50 to 100, 150,000 grants can actually become a real risk for the organization because you have to deliver all these extra things but you still have, don't have the time to find the day-to-day -day funding. So yeah, that, that mix is quite complicated. So within all that, we've uh, had an ongoing program to try and find appropriate commercial revenue uh, that sits, uh, it, that, that is aligned with our charitable goals, but achieves those charitable goals via other means. And that isn't always straightforward, but we've developed five uh, commercial services which are aligned with our charitable goals. At least one of them shows, shows enough promise around Fix My Street to, you know, you can imagine it would have the potential to be spun out as a, a commercially funded organization at some point uh, in the future. So I, I guess the, 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 the approach we're taking is where it's possible to move some of these core efforts and have them funded by other means because they'll be sustainable and they'll, you know, they'll be supported over a long time. You can actually build some, a successful part of the organization and potentially free up more time within uh, the core organization to, to do new things. Uh, one, one final point is the, the challenge though with, with balancing commercial and charitable work is that on the one side where you're advocating for political change through one of your services and then on the other side you're working hand in hand with a local government organization as a client, that changes the dynamic quite substantially. We had one situation where uh, we uh, obviously we run, we run these FOI services and what do they know especially and we had a local government client who we were providing an FOI service to the client 
And when the client asked us to remove some material from the charitable service, that caused a massive conflict of interest. We had to ultimately get rid of the client, but it creates all those different dynamics that you need to deal with as well. So complicated, huge amount of fun, but yeah, no easy answers. And always trying to find the way to kind of uh, you know, find out a, a positive, sustainable future for different parts of the organisation and carefully target the charitable funding we can find. Hi, I'm Rachel. I run 360 Giving. We are um, opening up funding data so that anyone can find out who is funding what, where, how much. Um, in answer to your question, what's working well, I think picking up on Stacey's point, there are lots of good initiatives out there. There's lots of sharing. I personally feel there is a, a great sense of community. Here we are at TikTok, um, from people from all over the world. I think there is a lot of willingness to learn from and, and support one another. And that really has seen a, a real uplift in the last five years in particular, I would say. And I, I personally am always amazed and grateful for the time that people are willing to give when you're starting out on initiatives. You're know, just trying to throw stuff at a wall and see what works. Um, and I think funders have been particularly good at trying to join up their grantees to help have those conversations so you do feel part of the community. What needs to change? I don't think anyone would be surprised if I say that funding needs to be more sustainable, so long-term, not just for projects. You don't solve intractable long-term issues with a one-year project grant. Um, and I think there should be more willingness to allow for failure at, at a realistic percentage rate. I'm rarely asked to write about what stuff isn't working. I'm asked to write about outcomes and targets. And I put a challenge section into every funder report that I write, but it's not always um, perhaps uh, as honest as it should be. It's sometimes talking about challenges that I will then overcome to get more funding. Um, and I think funders are wise to that as well. So it's about how do you create a space to really talk about failure and change and, and try stuff out in civic tech, which isn't easy to do because you're often doing it for the first time. Um, and I think another thing that needs to change is it's seen as a little bit niche. So if you don't fund civic tech, how do you start funding this stuff? Um, actually, lots of funders we have found when we look at their data that they're sharing with us. So the big lottery fund, a big, a big funder in the UK, didn't really necessarily think they were funding some of this stuff. And then when we looked at their grants, we could show them lots of grants where they had been funding this stuff. They just didn't call it civic tech. So there's something about labelling, I think, that um, can put people off. And I think picking up on your point, Mark, should grantees be a bit braver about seeking commercial income? Should we only rely on grants to support civic tech? I think the answer is no, we can't. Um, but it's not easy and it feels a bit scary sometimes to have to start seeking that commercial income. So some advice and ideas on that I think would be really welcome from funders as well. Um, <clears throat> a little background from, from our organization is the Open Culture Foundation. Our, our model, I think it, the question is not how to sustain, but the, the question is, the hardest one is how to scale up. Yeah, because um, our model is um, Open Culture Foundation is founded by different open source communities. So uh, those communities, they are not legal entities. So they have their uh, independent account in our organization. So we kind of like an umbrella organization. We take 10% for overhead to run a courting office and uh, the infrastructure. So. Um, we can run this model for, I can see, maybe 10, next 10 years, but how you scale up. So that would be, that would be, that would be very challenging. And I think, ideally, I think um, for us, um, most civic tech um, are open source. So how, how, how they build up their own community and um, um, not only, uh, not um, build the community around the civic tech project. And because, um, those open source or civic tech uh, tools usually they require mass of the user in certain city or country. So um, because or some cross source, uh, some tools is a cross source tool. So maybe we can consider uh, crowdfunding some service. You provide some service for one dollar or two dollar a week or a month. So this kind of stuff is actually we do have some. Um, another civic tech organization right now in Taiwan. They do the Parliament Watch. They are running this model right now. Um, not very success. They have to go to the, their funder every month to get the cash. But um, still, they, they, 
like trying to uh, find a find a way to do their business model. But uh, after all, I think if we are non-profit organization, the way you sustain it is always come from different donors. Um, maybe it's a big funder, or maybe it's a small donor, uh, like uh, your users. So how how to combine your tool to engage citizen or user and the money, I think that would be the, the things we can consider. Right. Uh, my name is uh, Kole Shatima. I work with the MacArthur Foundation. I'm based in Abuja. Um, I think for the groups that I deal with on a regular basis, I think that they are always facing challenges. Um, these are very small groups who have uh, very little capacity to um, get the resources that they need uh, in order to do their work, um, who are bounded by some legal requirements that is difficult for them to meet. And therefore, the tendency is that they usually get um, small amounts of money. Um, they usually get um, funds that are issue specific. Um, we are not able to support them in terms of giving them a general support because of some somebody somewhere have done some rules and regulations. So I think that you know, for many of these groups, is really, really always struggling about um, you know, issue-based uh, support, uh, short-term support. Uh, many funders even don't support them in terms of their human resources and other things. They just want them to implement um, the project. They don't care whether how they are stopping the place or what kind of other overhead costs they do and other things. So, um, I think for many of those groups, it's really, really a big struggle. And uh, we definitely uh, focusing in terms of issues. Um, the only bright side of it is that we try as much as possible uh, to make it a three-year grant and also as much as possible to see if we can, you know, even if it is the issue, we try to see if we can also carry them over, over the next set of issues, rather than just dumping them at the end of the three-year and say, Bye bye to them and things, but I, I think that uh, for many of these groups, I think um, I think I see struggles uh, every day, and it's it's, it's not good. So maybe um, it, we could follow up on this point uh, that uh, came up, I think, across the the practitioners on the panel about sort of the uh, balancing the short term objectives um, against the the cycles, the short term cycles, funding cycles, kind of balancing longer term impact. Uh, this is also something that was picked up in the, the Knight Foundation reports on uh, scaling civic tech that was released last year. And uh, so maybe beginning w with Stacy and Cole, um, if you could sort of speak to whether f the current funding modalities are well suited to longer term investment and what some of the constraints around that are, and uh, then if any, any of the others on the panel want to uh, weigh in as well, that would be great. Sure. So um, the way we've thought about funding uh, has evolved somewhat over time in terms of uh, how we measure short-term success to understand what long-term potential is. Um, in general, when we're doing nonprofit funding, we really try to emphasize um, core general operating support um, for all the reasons that Mark had articulated about the um, the problems that that project-related funding um, can cause or or the the wrong incentives that can be put in place. Um, we are very cognizant of the fact that you can't measure um, impact over the course of a one-year grant or even a three-year grant. Um, and now I've been doing this for, um, I'm going in my 10th year now, and um, you know I, I'm finally starting to see or be able to articulate with some of our longer-term investees um, actual end user impact in ways that was very difficult in the first few years. So the way we've tried to mitigate that is um, to do a milestone based funding so we know that um, there's something kind of shorter term that's usually kind of more output oriented or process oriented than it is outcome oriented, but at least it gets everybody on the same page that we're headed in the same direction. Um, and then um, we look at longer term impact uh, in terms of defining um, the actual um, change or improvement to life that's happening to the users of a service or the beneficiaries. Um, so 
um, you know, in the early years, we invested in a lot of what we call ecosystem building activities, and we still do that today um, with things like supporting Civic Hall and Mika's here today. Um, it's very important to be building an ecosystem around civic tech to give entrepreneurs the support they need in order to stay alive long enough to get to the impact that we're all um, trying to achieve. So um, we have funding milestones uh, and goals around ecosystem building, and then we have longer term goals around um, social impact or impact to end users. So that's how we try to balance the, the short term and the long term. Um, I, I think that for us, I think we talk about momentum. Do we see momentum towards that direction? Do we see some movement, some uh, you know, directions change in that what, what we're trying to achieve and I think. We know that because of a three year funding or I don't know, even five, six years funding, probably you know, we can see some movements in the right direction, but probably I don't think that we are going to have an impact in terms of what we are trying to do in our things. You know? So I think that um, so as much as possible, yes, we may have some big things that we talk about in terms of goals and impact and I think, but the real issue is are we moving in the right direction? And is that sufficient for us to see whether that is enough for us to continue and I think, you know. But I also want to say that because we are not like, a, we are not a techie, our origin is different from Omidia and others. So I think that we also appreciate our own limitations that uh, probably there are other people who are able to invest in this field, so to speak, much more other than others, uh, because we are coming into this from a different direction than others, and therefore uh, I can see that you know in some ways we may not be the um, best uh, supporters uh, of many of the people in the field, because that is not really what is driving us. So it's, what may be driving us is maybe about education or about health or accountability or whatever it is, and then we try to see, okay, how can we use the technology in order to help us to deliver those kinds of things as well? Thank you. Um, Rachel. Sorry, sorry. A, a point about short term versus long term, just on a very practical level. Um, we were incubated by a funder, so in t just really short term, and it was just me writing a strategy trying to raise some money. You know, we had a, a desk and a space and support and contacts and access through that funder. So there's there's supporting kind as well, which I think you'd be surprised. Actually, say you're not maybe best placed. I think you'd be surprised how helpful your contacts book could be to startups. And and that time and generosity of of supporting kind really, I think, is is important to acknowledge as well. And um, then that shifting into long term because you've had the time and space to think what's needed short term to get going. That, that, that's a, a big piece of learning and, and appreciated support that we got. Okay, well, I, I do want to open this up to audience questions here in a minute. Um, uh, before we go there, I was wondering if any of the panelists had any thoughts on sort of the impact of the global environment right now, the effect that it's having as we're thinking about sort of broadening support for civic tech. Um, we've certainly moved from um, uh, much more cyber utopianism uh, to sort of cyber skepticism and pessimism. And at the same time, we're seeing this decline in trust in, in democratic institutions around the world. Stacy, you mentioned sort of an uptick in advocacy focused or issue focused um, efforts. I'm just wondering if others, if there are observations as to how this current moment uh, and how these global events are, are shaping the opportunities uh, or maybe a little bit of skittishness um, in, in supporting civic tech. I'll just, just make two points. One is, yeah, I, I think I've just described civic tech as a maturing sector and as much as there are a number of practitioners, obviously a lot of us in this room, um, who've been through a number of rounds of different projects, different experiences and so on, so they've the ability to kind of share them and kind of understand that there are methods and techniques and, and approaches that can actually make a measurable difference and, and you know, collectively we can be thinking rather than, well actually a more general point, rather than this obsession with novelty, especially in projects funds, we, we want to give you a, a relatively modest amount of money to do a new thing that we can see we collectively came up with. That obsession with, with uh, new tools, new techniques is, is incredibly damaging. You know, when we're, we're, what we're trying to do is build a, re a relatively finite body of, of activity that we can use to make change happen in the world. You know? So 
either these kind of convening uh, meetings are incredibly important for that, for kind of that sharing of knowledge, <coughs> but also recognizing that just because something has been done before and uh, it could be used successfully in another place, you're, that, that there's a huge amount of efficiency that could be drawn from that. And, and certainly thinking about that in a global perspective is incredibly important. Anyone else? Yes, I had mentioned before uh, that we've seen engagement really increasing uh, in terms of the types of civic tech projects that are coming through the pipeline. I think the, the corollary to that is projects that are around service delivery, um, uh, I think are a bit challenged right now in certain countries, and I'll just use the U.S. as an example. You know, over the last eight years when um, civic tech uh, was, as a movement, fairly engaged at the federal level with the Obama administration, and there were a lot of um, young, talented people you know, going actually to work in government um, to deploy tech at the national level, um, in the new administration context, those same people have, have either left or are very worried about the ways in which civic tech deployed by government um, could be used for harm instead of good. And so um, uh, I think the, the second trend we're seeing in addition to a rise in tech around engagement is a lot more um, skittishness around tech for service delivery and what it means to partner with governments um, to deploy technology. It, it varies um, between the federal level and the city level. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar, there are certain cities in the US, for example, that have come out very vocally in opposition to the federal government's policies around things like immigration um, and have set themselves up um, to be sanctuary cities or safe places. And so there are pockets where tech for service delivery and, and the, the talent that is focused on that uh, is now gravitating to work with cities, but in general, the proposition of, of um, tech for service delivery is a lot more fraught um, than it was a, a few years ago. And so when we're measuring kind of the, the impact of our portfolio and where we're seeing the most progress um, in the last six months, it's been on the engagement side, not on the service delivery side. Any other thoughts before we open it up? Okay. We've got about five minutes, so maybe if we could take a collection of questions and then uh, just uh, uh, let the panelists respond as, as appropriate. I see uh, David. And yeah. Go ahead. So you go, go ahead, David. It's fun to be a donor, asking the donor now. Um, so the, I guess the corollary, we do a lot of long-term general operating support funding for those flutter grantees like. The corollary to that, or the other side of the coin, is that we don't have as much grant making to fund new organizations, emerging in the civic tech field, there are a lot of organizations now that have staff of two or three or four. Oftentimes they have more board members than they have staff. And so I'm curious for your advice on when to stop funding. How, how should we know when to stop funding to make room for other organizations? These little questions, is that all right? Okay, these are the, I would just write down my four top changes. One is if it's an ecosystem, treat it like an ecosystem, which means codependence of the variables, like you have to make sure that the, it operates as an ecosystem. The second one is old, there are old civic institutions, if you're going into a set, and this is not true for the, the, the long term, but if you're going in new, don't just fund civic tech as a thing, it's a, you're in a sector already understand and know that sector, don't not ignore the old civic ecosystem that's already there. And it may be putting a bit into that that's going to be more effective than funding new things. Um, no map, learn other donors. I think most of us are playing donors off against each other a bit, but that's incredibly inefficient, and actually more efficiency there would be better. And then fund leadership infrastructure, back end, and network field building stuff, because that's actually how we get the value from each other. It's things like this that make that look, increase things exponentially. Really boring stuff, but we're all having to deal with GDPR, even US organizations. Somebody just help convene something quick. That, you know, it's that stuff that reduces costs, I guess. Anyway, those are my top brass. Yes, sir. Yeah, a quick question. On, we talk a lot, when we talk about the ecosystem and the health of the ecosystem, we often focus on the you know, impact, etc. There are also some external factors that seem very powerful. I wanted to mention sort of, sort of the privacy and the impact <coughs> privacy discussion. And the second one is sort of the fact that we are 
increasingly delivering all these semi-silly text stuff under the platforms. And these are sort of the huge issues around that. And recently, one of the media uh, grantees, Pandiar, raised the issues of a like, lack of traditional content uh, by Facebook. I'm wondering if like donors have a role to play in highlighting sort of what are the, rules, the big rules of the game that civic tech is living under on privacy and the platforms. Yes, sir. Also, a short question following up on your question. You know, you have the one sector of startups. You may also have old institutions that work on governance for a long time, but have to transform themselves to, to gear up to working with technology. What's your experience on that front? And then this was, did you have a question as well? Uh, yes. Uh, so I'm wondering, uh, and part of my interest in this topic is that I've been I'm wondering, is there any work that donors, uh, funders in civic tech are doing to um, educate um, other foundations and donors uh, that civic tech can be a means to their end? So, for instance, there are many, many funders who aren't, who don't self-proclaim themselves, self, you know, as uh, civic tech interested, but, um, you know, I think kind of, is there is there a role that donors are pursuing to kind of educate other donors? Okay, and one last question, Joe. Uh, is anyone doing payment by results or outcomes based commissioning or social impact bondy stuff? Okay. Or is that bad? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have, uh, we have a battery of questions. Uh, I'm going to let each of the panelists sort of respond to uh, the questions as, as appropriate, as they feel comfortable. Um, and then I'd like you to end and conclude with sort of a one sentence summary for, for our benefit in thinking about this donors forum, um, you know, what's the most valuable insight that you think funders and practitioners uh, could better understand about each other uh, coming out of the forum? Uh, and so, Stacey, maybe we'll just start with you. Can I remind me? Oh, sure. Remind me of a um, question. I know David's so was about when to stop, when to stop. funding. And also mergers and acquisitions. Okay. <laughs> role of donors and incentivizing yeah. Um, do donors have a role to play in sort of government? Okay. Sort of the FENDR uh, example. Yes. Um, and education uh, between and among foundations and donors and uh, payment by results. Yes, okay. Um, so when to stop funding um, and, and how to think about consolidation, um, that is a huge question for us. Um, you know, we really try to think hard about dependency and, um, and the um, unintended effects of um, creating a, an unhealthy financial relationship between ourselves and an investee, especially when we're in an investee for a long period of time. Uh, we don't have a great answer to that. We try to remain under 20% of an organization's funding um, to limit that issue. And we also try to communicate very far in advance um, before ending a funding relationship um, so that it doesn't come as a surprise and an organization has time to think about uh, its next steps. Um, we used to have a pretty strong policy about not funding an organization for more than, say, six or seven years total because we were providing growth capital um, and, uh, and not perpetual capital. And while we certainly still don't do perpetual, we are more flexible now about thinking uh, about organizations that are sort of foundational to the field um, and ways in which we can be supportive for sometimes longer periods of time. But I don't have a great answer to that question. Um, with respect to mergers and acquisitions, uh, um, you know, those terms are uncomfortable, I think, in, in the nonprofit space and, and civil society space. but. Um, but I do think it's very important to think about how combinations of organizations um, can be more impactful and more cost effective and efficient. And donors do have a role to play there in identifying what, what parties could go together well. Um, and, and we don't do enough of that, I think, because donors are also uncomfortable with it. So room for opportunity, for sure. Um, on um, your topic, Anders, about uh, role of donors with the platforms, um, 
uh, I was personally engaged with VanDR um, and that set of organizations in um, helping um, get those issues uh, surfaced um, publicly, and um, so I, I consider that a you know a tiny victory um, <laughs> in a large war around um, holding platforms accountable for the things that that happen on their platforms, whether it's intentional or unintended. Um, uh, you know, it is also challenging because uh, we want, uh, in some cases, to partner with platforms um, to try to create the social impact that we're trying to create. And so it's another one of these really messy things where um, sometimes uh, we're trying to, to partner um, in the spirit of creating an outcome, and sometimes we're more adversarial or oppositional. Um, in the case of Omidyar Group, we have several different teams, and so sometimes you know, one team will be pursuing more of an external strategy, and one team will be pursuing more of an internal strategy, but it, it's tough. Um, um, collaboration between foundations and donors, um, uh, sharing practices, and payments by results. Okay. Um, so on payments by results, first, um, social impact bonds, um, we definitely support that um, and invest uh, or invest in the intermediaries um, who create those at the Omidyar network level. Um, I haven't seen a lot in the civic tech space yet, um, and I have uh, you know, had that on my radar for a while because I think there are potential opportunities for civic tech players to be one of the delivery providers in a social impact bond or pay for results situation. Um, so I'd be curious if um, offline, please come talk to me about that because I'd love to see more of that happening. And then finally, col um, collaboration uh, between uh, donors and um, practitioners. Um, or I think sharing information uh, uh, between and among foundations and donors. Oh, yes, yes. Um, yeah, so I think today the way that happens is very one-on-one. -on -one. You know, donors know who fund in similar spaces, know each other, um, and so we share information um, informally, um, uh, or you know, we <coughs> network in in kind of general ways where you might find an investee that uh, has a, a common interest for multiple funders. Uh, and I'd, I'd use Code for America as an example of that, where they've been funded by recently by Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, for example, who doesn't have an explicit focus on civic tech, um, but uh, has an interest in, in better public service delivery. Uh, and so, you know, we intersect that way, but I think it is a great idea to try to systematize that a little bit more um, and, uh, and try to, to, for civic tech funders to get more involved in, in trying to pitch civic tech as an investment um, area to other funders, and there's room for improvement for Maybe sure. Maybe through a diverse <laughs> forum. Yeah. For example, yes. Great. Mark? Um, so we're really over time, so I'm going to keep this very quick. Um, we had a conversation last week uh, internally about people's careers, and using the phrase a career within our type of space, the fact that people may want to have career progression and move up and be able to you know, expand their, their capabilities and horizons and so on, that casting that against uh, your piecemeal funding, uncertainty, always six months away from disaster, you know, that, that's again a difficult thing to do. The, um, the, on, on the kind of mergers and acquisitions, we're, we're very polite about not wanting to discuss that. And as a result, lots of NGOs just can continue on. And they don't continue, because it's, you can continue on a project NGO in your spare time, you're around paid, some paid for work, all the rest of it. So lots of these things just kind of go on and on and on. Um, but you obviously come in, I spent four years uh, at the end of my commercial career merging companies together. There's no such thing as a is a merger, it's always a takeover. <laughs> you know, there's always one dominant partner and uh, you know, that changes things. So of course it's, it may be uncomfortable to talk about it in this space, but if we, if we don't do it because we don't want to upset people and then we squander people's lives because they just fritter away a, a project which isn't actually having some impact, maybe we're doing more damage that way as well. So lots of things to think about. But I'm positive about the future, and I'm certainly positive about this, but we're way over time, so.
Gemma wants to do a photograph, who's saying. Okay, I'll be very quick. Um, when to stop funding big versus new, I, I mean, I, it, that links into all of Karen's points that she made, all of which I agree with, and in the interest of transparency, I should say she and I used to work together, so we've discussed this at length. Um, treat it like an ecosystem. What is your strategy? What do you want to achieve? How's the ecosystem looking? If you can't, if you're worried about, you know, long term, and I would question what some people think long term is. I was having a conversation recently with a funder in the UK. They fund minimum 10 years. That's long term for them. What's your long term? Um, so, I, you know, if you're trying to fix homelessness, uh, there might be a role in civic tech in that, and it might be 10 years worth of funding to some organisations and then short bits to new organisations. You can mix and match. That might involve changing some of your funding mechanisms, which may not be so so easy but actually maybe you have to do things differently and you can do big versus new um, but it should treat it as an ecosystem and see see how it's coming together um, and i think this goes back to the, the labeling of, of civic tech so you know actually is the issue you're trying to improve health outcomes or education outcomes or housing and homelessness there's a role for civic tech in all of those things um, so what is your strategy as a funder for the for the ecosystem and, and the supporting civic tech within that um, in terms of um, funders sharing stuff to educate others, there was an example recently in the UK where six funders got together um, with a, a company called Shift Design, and they looked at the tech for good funding space, and one of the key findings from that was three years isn't long enough to fund a tech for good project, um, and, that, and part of the, the reason for that work was to try and bring in other funders who are a bit scared about getting into this space, so I recommend having a look at that Shift Design work. Um, people can come and ask me about it afterwards if they want to find out more. Um, and I would, I would, the thing about mergers and acquisitions, I would push that back onto funders. A lot of you are funding the same stuff. Why aren't you merging? Why aren't you putting in pots of money together and funding it? Why should we be the only people who are asked to do that? Okay, so go back to the Doran Forum. What would I see um, in the Doran Forum? Donor foreign happen. I would like to say um, from from the from the practitioners, um, we should share more um, knowledge on your own funding model. We can share different governance model, funding model. How we persuade your donor? Um, what's your arguments? And this kind of knowledge is what we need to share more with each other and in different levels. Some is a city level, some is a national level, and then now we have an international networking like a COFO O, and soon it will open up to um, all kind of civic tech organization. And also, um, I want to echo um, that one say, um, we should engage more traditional civil, civil society organization. And as a civic tech, um, maybe some of us are very good at tech, but um, the civic problem, some people are already studied for decades, two de decades. So um, if we can um, uh, bring more traditional civil society to understand the digital international, uh, internet um, progress, like uh, what's AI, big data, blockchain, and uh, try to keep them up, I think that would be more healthy for your um, your your sustainability, and uh, go to the crowd. Yeah. Um, on mergers and acquisitions, I would say this is a very sensitive topic to raise with people, um, but certainly personally, I have tried to raise it as a friend and so that not as a funder. Um, because I see some of the challenges some of these organizations are facing and maybe coming together might be a better option. And um, sadly, I think that I have seen pushback from all those people. I think they have left the organizations to die instead of probably bringing their synergies together and see what they can actually achieve in our things. I think that our funding cycle, usually you know, we fund for about 10 years uh, until recently. Um, and sometimes it's really difficult to say, I'm going to cut you off, I don't know why, but um, there are people that we have been funding for more than 10 years, and um, we think they are doing the work they are doing, which is good, and therefore it's difficult for us to now say, well, you know, look for new people to do uh, something else. Uh, and I, I realize the danger also of perpetuating some organizations, but there are some organizations that have been doing so well that probably one also has to be careful not just to cut people because of car. 
you want new people. The last point I want to make in terms of educating each other and other things, uh, maybe it's not conscious, but I know that you know our colleagues, for example, from, from Omidia will claim that they are not trying to lobby, but they tell us you know we should be doing some more work on this and other things and um, and so you know there are all these informal conversations that you people with people who are really this is their field and I think and they think that you know, you know why don't you think about these people you know and I think and of course they also when come to us and say um, you know how does the field look like you know who should we be talking to and I think so I think there's always some cross fertilization and conversations about among ourselves about what we should do and what we should not do and I things and especially for those of us uh, in the field I think because we are not really many so we talk to each other all the time anyway in terms of who do we see what should we be doing what should not be doing our things um, is there any insight I think there's no insight but just to you know, appreciate the fact that all of us have our own limitations in terms of what we are legally uh, allowed to do and what we're not allowed to do and therefore sometimes it's very difficult really to explain to people that why you cannot do this just because that's what it is, you know? And I think that re realizing that limitation as to what um, grantees can do and what funders can do and not, and our things, I think is going to help a lot in trying to, all of us appreciate each other's limitations. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, everyone. Um, I, I appreciate you all uh, bearing with us under the time constraints. I think it was a fascinating discussion. Look forward to continuing the conversation. If you have any thoughts you would like to feed in as we're, we're planning this donors forum in Tbilisi, uh, please come and find us. Um, we'll be around after, and uh, thank you.